I said, I, I said something profound. I guess, I, I guess so, depending on your definition of profound. <laughs> well, good evening. Good to see you guys on a just a beautifully nice Wednesday evening, right? I, I didn't hear an amen on that one. <laughs> you mean you don't like it when it's 35 degrees outside and rain? Yeah, 35 is fine if it's sunshiny outside, right? Or snow, yeah. As I told Alan today, just snow already. Just either stop raining or just snow. But this 34-degree rain thing is, oy. Well, it's good to see you guys inside, and we're grateful for a building <laughs> that keeps us warm and dry. That's uh, something to be thankful for tonight. Uh, there's an amen. All right, so. If you were watching with us online tonight because you stayed home, uh, we are glad that you were with us this evening. Go ahead and open up your Bibles and uh, open them up to Revelation chapter 2. Uh, as you do that, I'm going to pray, and then we will kind of catch ourselves back up to where we left off a few weeks ago and jump into things. Heavenly Father, we are grateful tonight for the opportunity to come together and to worship through Bible study, through looking into your word. Lord, we would uh, also want to just pause for a few moments tonight and just pray for our nation, pray for our country. As we've seen um, uh, some pretty significant events unfold this afternoon. Lord, I pray that you would give us a spirit of peace and of wisdom and understanding, and that as a church, uh, as a local church here, as, as the believers in Christ around this country, that, Lord, we would as a people unite around your kingdom uh, that, uh, as we talked on Sunday morning, Lord, you have given us the name of, that you are uh, the Lord, our banner, that Lord, our rallying, our attention would, would be to you, that we would unite around you as a people with the gospel and for the kingdom of God, and that Lord, you would use us as your people, as salt and light to a nation and to a world that desperately needs light and understanding. So Lord, would you do that for us this evening and give us insight into your word through the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Revelation chapter 2. We are in the middle of looking at the seven letters to the seven churches that uh, John writes to. John writes to through the inspiration of the risen Christ. And we have looked at, up to this point in chapter 2, the first two letters to the church in Ephesus and to the church in Smyrna. And as we saw the letters to those two churches, a couple things that we saw. First of all, Ephesus was commended for their adherence to, their fight for, their determination to hang on to truth. Uh, they fought for it. They wouldn't put up with false teachers. And they had kept, if you so, if so to speak, their doctrinal purity, if you will. They had stuck to the apostles' teaching. But in the process, they had uh, lost their first love. They had lost or they had lost sight of their love for Christ and their motivation for that truth and got into, got into a bit of legalism. So they were commended for their dedication to the apostles' teaching, but they were also reprimanded and warned about their lack of love. We saw the next church was, was the church Smyrna. And Smyrna was commended for uh, and encouraged to stay faithful as they faced oncoming persecution. And they really, there's not anything they're really warned against. They're just encouraged to hang in there, that they're going to face persecution, and uh, that they have been a faithful people. So those are the first two letters. Now, as we come to the city of Pergamum, this next church, just as a reminder here, we have these seven letters. And if you were to imagine yourself in modern-day Turkey, uh, if you see how that, see that that nation looks like on the map here, these seven churches kind of make a ring on the southwest coast of what today would be called Turkey or Asia Minor. And Pergamum is the third city on kind of a, a circular route. It's about 40 miles to the northeast of Smyrna. It's the next one on that circular route. We began with Ephesus and Smyrna, and now we're throwing our way around. And all these cities, uh, all the cultures of these cities are going to be somewhat similar. I mean, th these, are, these are towns, these are communities that are relatively close together. So it's not like each one of these cities has a markedly different culture from the other seven, 
Uh, there are sometimes maybe things going on a little bit more than one city than the next, but they're all dealing with uh, the existence of pagan rituals and pagan temples to the Greek or Roman gods in their communities. They're also all dealing with the rise of the, of the imperial cult of the Roman Empire, that is, in, uh, the, the worship of the emperor, which was a growing thing even in the first century. It had been going on for some time. It would continue for some time to come. The idea that the Caesar, whoever he was, was divine. Uh, we don't see this just in the Roman Empire. Even the ancient Egyptians did this with their pharaohs. This is something that Israel dealt with when they were in captivity in Egypt some uh, 1,500 years before this. So uh, the, the, the imperial cult was part of something that was going on as well. As a result, especially as a result of the worship of the Caesar, uh, Christians found themselves often the objects of persecution or at the very least social isolation because it was expected that people would pay tribute verbally and otherwise to the Caesar. It was a common thing to say, be required to in public settings, say Caesar is Lord. And obviously Christians did not want to do that for obvious reasons. And uh, so they would often face persecution or at the very least some measure of hostility from the culture or from the society around them. All of these churches would have dealt with that. They all would have dealt with temples to, to Roman gods and Greek gods. Uh, they all would have dealt with a very hostile, for the most part, culture. Definitely, obviously, not a Christian culture. So they're all dealing with some of these things together. Now, when we get to the city of Pergamum in particular, Pergamum was an impressive town, one of the bigger cities in that part of the world. Uh, Pergamum, being inland, uh, was known for you know, an approximately 1,000 foot tall citadel. Um, essentially, there were cliffs, mountains, and, and Pergamum stood, there was a fortified part of the city of Pergamum that stood atop a 1,000 foot rise that overlooked the entire valley, the river valley that it was, that it was uh, set in. Now, the main city was down at the bottom, but there's this fortified thing up on top. Up on top of there, there are four temples. There's a temple to Zeus. There's a temple to Athena. There is a temple to another god named Asclepius and one to Dionysus. Uh, if you're familiar with your Greek gods, you, know, you may recognize those, all those. Uh, the temple to Zeus in particular sat another several hundred feet above all the other ones on the top of this mountain. So you can imagine, you can see Pergamum from everywhere in that area. This is an impressive sight. Uh, in addition to those four temples, Pergamum was the actual official capital, uh, provincial capital, under the Roman Empire, and as also as a result, it was the official named capital of the imperial cult. In other words, that was, it was the administrative, official, you're in charge of the area portion of the of the. Of the worship of the Roman emperor. So Pergamum is a big city. It's, it's an important city. It's an impressive looking city. There was also an ancient library there that had upwards of 200,000 volumes, which in the ancient times, that's a lot of books, <laughs> scrolls, uh, whatever. Uh, so Pergamum is a, a, an impressive place. Uh, and like all these other places, they all have temples. They all have uh, pagan rituals going on. But Pergamum is kind of the capital of all this. So we're going to keep that in mind as we read chapter 2, verse 12. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, The one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name, and did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. So you also have some who, in the same way, hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna. I will give him a, wild, a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows 
to he who receives it. Now, as you look at this, we want to look at a couple things. And one, first of all, just the introduction that we have here in verse 12, where he says, this is the one who has the sharp two-edged sword in his mouth. If you were to go back to the description of the risen Christ in chapter 1, you would see this description that he had a sword out of his mouth. And we talked a little bit about that a few uh, back in November when we looked at that passage. That sword was not a small dagger. It wasn't a smaller sword. This was that uh, long, two, uh, double-edged, long sword. Now, this, this would have been a big, heavy sword. And it was not, not only an instrument of war, but it was a symbol of authority and judgment. The, in the society and in the Bible, this sword is a, is a symbol of saying, I have the ability to execute judgment. And I use the term execute not in killing somebody, but in performing justice, to have that role of a judge, if you will. And so the, the description of Jesus in chapter 1 and here again in verse 12, there is this idea that Jesus Christ, the risen Lord, has within him the authority and the ability to judge and to execute the results of that judgment. So you can imagine what this might mean to a group of people who live in the shadow and the, of the capital of, of, of an imperial Caesar worship cult or all the worship of all these other gods and a society that expects that of you. And as we talked about a couple weeks ago with the city of, uh, of Smyrna in particular, if you are in a culture that says and has the expectation that you pay homage to the Caesar by saying Caesar is Lord, or you have to do sacrifice to this God or to that God, you have to go through these rituals. And if you don't do that, there may not necessarily be any formal legal issues, but if you don't do that, the rest of the culture or society looks upon you with suspicion. In fact, if you would not obey the, the, the requirements for the imperial cult, that is, you wouldn't in these public settings, if you would not be willing to say Caesar is Lord, and quite frankly, the Romans didn't care what else you believed as long as you said that. If you wouldn't say that, you were looked upon with suspicion. Uh, in fact, sometimes Christians were actually called atheists, as strange as that might sound, because they refused to acknowledge all these gods, including the Caesar as God. So if you don't, re if you don't recognize all these gods, you don't recognize Caesar as God, you don't believe in gods, so you're an atheist. So it's just some of the misunderstanding of what was going on in the first century. So if you are being falsely accused, if people are assuming you are somehow traitorous or that you can't be trusted because you won't say or do certain things that everyone else does you can see the value in knowing that there is someone who knows the truth someone who knows what things really are i mean I, I, are we not in a culture today that's desperate to know what's actually true nobody trusts one another and so we're in a, we're in a culture and the truth is they were war too what's true what's not what's valid what isn't and so what we have here is our introduction is that our risen Lord, our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, not only has the power, but he knows and has the authority and the ability to execute judgment. He is all wise. And elsewhere, the, the scripture says that the word of God is like a is sharper than a two-edged sword, the ability to cut into sinew and bone. He sees into our hearts and our minds, and not just mine, but yours and everyone else's. So when he executes judgment, he knows what he's doing. He doesn't have to, we don't have to worry when God says something about whether or not it's true or not. He sees it all. And in particular, what he's going to say here is this. He goes, I have the authority to judge. And in particular, he says, I'm going to tell you there's a couple things that I know about your situation in particular. So verse 13, he says this. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And I know that you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. So he says two things here. He says, first of all, I know where you live. <laughs> now, nowadays, <laughs> nowadays we say that, that's kind of a threat. You know? <laughs> I know where you live. <laughs> that's not what this obviously is, is trying to imply here. He says, I know that you live, I know where you live, I, I, you live in or dwell near Satan's throne, where Satan's home is. 
Now, this has caused no little conversation between those who have studied this text and going, what exactly is, is, is the point here? When he says, you live in Satan's home. Now, you know, uh, different cities today have different nicknames. If you go to Chicago, what's, what's Chicago's nickname? Windy City, right? Um, what's New Orleans' nickname? The, the Big Easy. What's Las Vegas? Sin City. Okay, now, now we're getting somewhere right now. <laughs> um, essentially, it sounds like he's calling Pergamum Satan City. How's that for an address? Is that where you want to be? Well, obviously, this is, this is where they're at. I know where you go. I know where you live. I think he's, he's, he's telling him, listen, I know that where you are is not easy. That you are smack in the middle of a place that's wicked, that's evil, that the culture is hostile to, that the culture is hostile to you. You live in a place where they expect you to pay homage to another man, Caesar, as God. And they expect you to have uh, rituals for other gods. They expect this of you. And you're at the capital of it. Now, again, these things are taking place in all these different cities that we're looking at here, that all the churches are in. But Pergamum is the capital. Satan's home, so to speak, is what he's saying here. He says, I know this is where you live. I know you are living, so to speak, at Satan's doorstep. And probably the emperor worship is really at the center of all this. Um, now, that's all fine and good, but let me, let me also suggest this. Um, God today still knows our address. All right? So whether you live in London or somewhere out in the woods between outside London, <laughs> Whether you live in Little Rock or Dallas or Chicago or even Las Vegas, God knows where you live. And really what, what that means is He knows your situation. He knows the temptations you face. He knows the circumstances around your work and your job and what people expect of you. He knows what your home life is like. He knows what the people around you are thinking and what their motives are. He knows the situations you're facing. He knows the challenges you have. He knows if your internet works or not. <laughs> he knows all these things. He knows the pressures that you feel, the fears that you possess. He knows if you think no one else understands you. He, he knows your situation. So if you're tempted sometimes tonight to think that no one else understands what I'm going through, He knows. And if you're the early church there in Pergamum, you might be tempted to think, yeah, everyone else has some of the same issues that we are. But it's worse here. You might be tempted to think that. If you're in Pergamum, you might be tempted to think, yeah, it's bad in Ephesus, it's bad in Thyatira, but it's worse here because we're in the capital. And he's saying, listen, God knows. He knows your situation. He knows what your uh, pressures are, and he knows how you've handled those things. In particular, he says this, I, I not only know where you are, he says, I know that in the middle of this, you have held fast my name, and you have not denied my faith, even in the days of Antipas. I know, he goes, you've been faithful. So not only do I know the pressures you've faced, I know how you've dealt with those and how you have stayed true to me. You've held on to me and to my name. So when they want you to say Caesar is Lord, you haven't done it. You have said Jesus is Lord, not Caesar is Lord. You have held in there. And I know it hasn't been easy. In fact, he says, I know it hasn't been easy because even one of you, by the name of Antipas, and we don't know anything about this guy, all we know is that whoever this Antipas is, he was one of the members of the church there in Pergamum, and apparently he faced a decision. He faced persecution. He faced pressure to the point that his life was taken from him because of his faithfulness to the name of Christ. That's all we know. We don't know what the specifics were. There's no other descriptions of him. We don't know what the situation was. 
All we know was that 1,900 years ago, maybe a little bit more than that, there was a guy named Antipas who was a believer in Christ, a follower of our Savior. So maybe you and I will meet one day, but we don't know who he is right now. And there was a point in time in the church's life there in Pergamum as he was following Christ that for whatever reason, the situation arose where he had to either deny Christ or lose his life. And he did not deny Christ. He stayed faithful to Christ and he lost his life as a result. That's all we know. Now, there's lots of Antipases throughout history. I would venture to say there's probably worse, there's, there's probably worse ways to be remembered than as someone who was faithful to the name of Christ in the face of death. That's all we know of him. So he tells them, I know your situation you're in. I know you have been faithful. You have kept, if you will, an iron grip on the name of Christ, even in the face of of persecution such as what Antipas had to do, and he was ultimately killed for his faith. So he said, I know these things. Um, and even though they faced these dangers, they did not deny him. You know, none of us have probably been in that situation. I don't know if any of us ever will be in that situation or not. Um, but the remarkable faith that a man like Antipas must have had, this isn't one of the apostles, this isn't one of the big, you know, this isn't Paul or Timothy. This is just a, a guy that no one throughout history will remember other than this one little verse, who stayed faithful to the name of Christ. Now that being said, Unlike Smyrna, and even unlike Ephesus, God says this, I have a few things, plural, <laughs> against you. Now, in particular, he talks about something called this. He says, there are some who have held, or you have, there, there are some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching bad to push double block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. So you also have some who in the same way hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Now, we briefly referred to the Nicolaitans when we looked at the city of Ephesus. And the church in Ephesus had done a really good job of not allowing the Nicolaitans or that belief system to stay in the church. So what's happening here? Well, s strangely enough, however faithful the people of Pergamum, the church in Pergamum had been, and they were in the place of persecution from the outside, they were struggling with maintaining truth and hanging on to the apostles' teaching on the inside. Um, it's kind of the opposite problem Ephesus was having. Ephesus, hanging to doctrinal purity, so to speak, but not really loving so well, and it seems that Pergamon was kind of having the other, the other issue. By the way, there's a reason we're called to worship in spirit and in truth, that we're supposed to have both love, have grace, but we're also to hang the truth. We have to keep both those things together as Christians. And sometimes walking that path of, of maintaining truth at the same time that we're exercising grace and compassion, these, these aren't always easy to do. And we've seen two churches now that are struggling with falling into a ditch on either side of that path. So this is what Pergamum, the church in Pergamum is, is struggling with. So let's look at this a little bit. We don't know the details of the Nicolaitan heresy or even for sure exactly what the teachings of Balaam are. But all we can do is look at a couple of clues. So the first thing I do, the, the teaching of Balaam, the only, the only time we really know about Balaam is that he was a prophet uh, in, that we read about in the book of Numbers. Now, does anybody know what particular story Balaam is associated with in the Old Testament, in the book of Numbers. Does anybody, does anybody recognize that story, that name? Okay, yeah, Balaam is the guy who's riding the talking donkey in, in that particular story. Now, if you don't know that particular story, let me just, I'm just going to quickly review it for you. It's in Numbers chapters 22, 23. And, and uh, Balaam was a, a seer, an oracle, a prophet. Not a, not a prophet of Yahweh, just a recognized prophet out there. 
as the people of Israel are traveling through the area around the kingdom of Moab, the king of Moab hires or wants to hire Balaam as a prophet to place a curse on Israel as they go by so that he will be able to defeat them and they won't bother him any. Just kind of cut it short there. Uh, Balaam uh, prays to God to ask, can I go do this? Now again, the Bible doesn't recognize him as a godly prophet, but, but he, he prays. And every once in a while, God uses tools that, to people that aren't necessarily normal in our, in our point of view. And so God says, uh, Balaam prays and says, should I, God, can I go curse Israel? And God says, um, no, <laughs> don't you dare go curse my people. They are my people. And so Balaam the next morning goes to these guys and said, no, I can't. I, the king of Moab was a guy named Balak. Balak, I won't do that. So they come back and Balak says, tell you what, if I up your fee a little bit, <laughs> if, I, if I multiply your fee, if I give you a lot, if I make you a wealthy prophet, what now? And Balaam goes back and prays again. <laughs> now, this time Balaam's praying. I think it's kind of implied in Scripture. When Balaam prays, he prays knowing what answer he wants. Y'all ever do that? <laughs> God, I, God um, I have something I want to play. I, I, I'm not asking God for your opinion here, God. I'm really telling you what I want you to do. We don't necessarily say it that way, but I have the answer I want. And, I'm, and so uh, sometimes the worst thing God could do for us is give us what we want. So um, you know, God's, when, when God gives you an answer, that should be it. When God says no, then you don't have to go back and reconsult, but a Balaam does, and God says, sure, go. <laughs> well, I, 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 I interpret the wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Because on the way, what, what does it appear that God's going to do to Balaam now that he wants to go? God gives him permission to go, but on the way, God sends an angel, a, an angel with a flaming sword in the path. And the donkey sees the angel and if you remember the story, he runs off the road and smashes Balaam's leg up against a, a stone fence. And finally, you know, Balaam's just beating this donkey, thinks it's the dumbest animal he's ever seen. And the donkey turns around and talks to him and says, what are you doing? I've always been a good donkey, haven't I? And what's funny is that Balaam just talks to him like it's normal. The donkey turns around and talks to him. <laughs> and the, the, Balaam's eyes are opened up and he sees the angel about to kill him. So the donkey saves Balaam's life. Balaam shows up. He warns the king of Moab, you're paying me, I get that, but just know I can only, tell you, I can only say to the people of Israel what, you told, what God tells me to say. It's not up to me, it's up to God. Balak goes, oh yeah, no problem. And then Balaam blesses the people of Israel. Numbers 22, 23. Now, that's the main story of Balaam. So what's he talking about here? Well, what we find out in the next chapter or so after this is that this king of Moab is obviously unsuccessful in cursing Israel. So what we find out by chapter 25 of Numbers is that uh, the men of Israel have found themselves tempted by the women of Moab. <laughs> this is, we'll just leave it there. And there's all kinds of idolatry and immorality going on. Not wholly unusual, unfortunately, for the men of Israel to do to do some of this intermarrying and this, some, some of this type of thing. Chapter 31 of, Numb of Numbers, there's a passing reference about verse 15 that says, um, again, that the soldiers, particularly of Israel, have found themselves distracted and engaging in immoral acts and idolatry with the women of Moab. And it says that they've done, uh, that the women of Moab have done this on the advice of Balaam. So the implication might be, again, we're reading between the lines a little bit here, but the implication seems to be that Balaam couldn't curse Israel. Balak couldn't get Balaam to do that. So Balak, the king of Moab, maybe under the counsel of Balaam, comes up with plan B. And plan B is, if we can't directly curse or attack them spiritually, what we'll do is we'll distract them and we'll divide their allegiance. We'll get them focused on something else. And before it's all said and done, those distractions, namely our Moabite women, will divert their attention from God and they'll be, they'll be worshiping idols in no time. And it worked. Now, 
Revelation chapter 2. What is the teaching of Balaam? What I just told you is all we know about Balaam is from the Old Testament. So if I were to take that and go, what is the teaching of Balaam? I think it might be something along the lines of this. That often what our greatest danger is is not some external, obviously sinful, blatantly wrong temptation or even doctrine. Satan very rarely comes to us and says, oh, God doesn't exist. You can't believe anything God says or you know, the preacher's a heretic. You know, that's not what usually happens. What does Satan usually do? To great effect, he distracts us. He gets us not to disown or to, to turn our backs on God directly, but instead to begin to form allegiances and loves and, and uh, things over here, over here that we like, that we don't reject God, we just come over here and try to have both. And then before we know it, we've never... We've never intentionally or even openly rejected God. We just don't have anything to do with Him because we've got other things going on over here. It's possible that what's going on in, Thi- or in, in Pergamum is not that they are denying Christ. They haven't. They, they're, they're, they're committed for their faithfulness. But that what's happening is that they aren't holding... They are finding themselves attracted to other things in their culture or other priorities. And that while there are some, and there may be a core in Pergamum that are holding faithful, they are not, as a church, holding each other accountable. They're allowing this distraction and falsehood and idolatry to work its way in slowly, and they're not stamping it out. They're not dealing with it. Well, you know, brother so-and-so, he's over here, he, he's really not doing what he needs to do, but that's between him and God, I'm not going to mess with that, that's, that's up to him. Uh, that's, that's, our, that's, our, that's our approach, isn't it? And yet, one of the purposes of a church, of a gathered, called out group of people, is that we hold each other accountable. Now, I don't mean that we're stooping over each other's shoulder, looking to, for an opportunity to whack, for every, whack something upside the head for every mistake. I don't mean that. But part of discipleship, part of the fellowship of God, is that we as a people pray for one another, we come alongside one another, we encourage one another, we help each other when we're down, and we we help each other when we're in the process of sin and making mistakes to say, get out of there. Don't do that. How could I help you come out of that? Apparently they were not doing that in Pergamum. Uh, In addition, the the Nicolaitans, we, we... don't know exactly for sure what this is, but based upon the description in Ephesus and in here, the Nicolaitans had something to do with idolatry. And again, it's, it, it appears, and he, he mentions this idea of eating meat sacrificed to idols. Well, that's also mentioned in Romans and 1 Corinthians. It's an issue for the early church, especially once the early church moved out of being just a Jewish makeup, it turned into a Gentile uh, situation. You had, um, as part of the Roman culture, you, I mean, you got four temples on, on top of the imperial cult going on there. You got five different major religions going on in Pergamum. And all of them will use a ritual meal as part of the process. You bring an animal, you sacrifice it, and then you take the leftovers and grill out. <laughs> all right. Well, in the end, Paul talks about how you're free to do that. But understand that some can see that as participating in idolatry. Now, what sounds like it might have, you know, Paul does say that's not idolatry in and of itself, but it may well be that what's happening is they are, in fact, participating as believers. They find themselves being pushed and tempted to participate in the cultural, religious things going on around them, whether it's the worship of Dionysus or, or Zeus or even the emperor. Well, I can do that. I can, I can go there and I can even say the words, but I don't really mean them. So imagine something like this. We know they're going to make us all say Caesar is Lord. Well, I don't want to do that. But I also got to make some money. I got to, I got to, I got to do business with these folks, folks tomorrow. So what I want to do is I want to go, and it's going to look kind of like I'm saying it, but I'm not really saying it. <laughs> we used to, when I was in college, we would do a skit 
uh, we, we had a, we had a, I was part of the Baptist Student Union back then, is what it was called. Uh, BCM is what it's called today. And we had a, we had a, 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 a sketch group uh, that we did skits. We would travel and do things for youth groups and whatnot. And we had one skit called Undercover Christian. And the skit was, you know, kind of like a Mission Impossible theme. You had the theme music going on. And the, the, the guy's in a cafeteria, and he gets a slip of paper from his agent. And his assignment, if he chooses to accept it, is to pray over his food without anybody seeing him. To, it's kind of in reverse, but the idea is to seemingly fit in while in my head going, well, I'm not really one of them. Imagine in the Old Testament, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego finding themselves being told by everyone around them, you have to worship the idol when Nebuchadnezzar's guys blow the trumpets. And they bow down and they say to themselves, I might be bowing on the outside, but I'm standing on the inside. Now, sometimes your kids have said that, haven't they? You tell your kids to stand up or sit down. I might be doing what you want on the outside, but on the inside, I'm not. <laughs> well, the point is this. Maybe you think you're not really engaging in idolatry on the outside or on, or on the inside, but you are on the outside. And whatever you think, you're still doing, you're still going through the motions. You're not. You may think you're being faithful, you may think you have well intentions, but you're looking like you're compromising. Now, not everyone in the church of Pergamon was doing that, but there are some, and they're allowing it to grow and to fester in the church. And the result is that people are beginning to engage in idolatry. And even if they don't mean to at first, what happens over time? What happens when you engage in these type of practices time and time and time again? Even if you start with the intention of not really meaning it, what's going to happen eventually? It's going to become part of who you are. And you will drift away from the worship of God and you'll drift towards the worship of something else. Now, I know you and I are not necessarily worried about finding ourselves worshiping Dionysus or Zeus. But if we're not careful, we can find ourselves aligned with, placing our hopes in, following, dedicating ourselves to an activity, a hobby, an interest, a person, a cause, and some of these may be good. But if we're not careful, the way Satan will attack us, often it's not by getting us to generically deny and get rid of our involvement with the Lord, but he will get us by getting our devotion elsewhere, and eventually our attention will be divided, and ultimately we'll go somewhere in another direction. And that is the danger that Pergamum is finding itself in, that they are on the path to idolatry, distraction, and not, uh, they're, they're not, because they're not holding fast to the truth, they're allowing these false things in the church, that over time they're going to be in trouble. And in fact, he even says this. So he's given them this warning. Verse 16, he says this, As a result of this, therefore, repent. Change your behavior. Do something different. Because if you don't, I'm coming to you quickly, he says, and I'm coming to make war against you. Now, when your rescuer is coming quickly, that's great news. When the guy who's going to whack you upside the head's coming quickly, well, not so much. <laughs> you know, there's, there's that, you know, if, if, you're, if you're a kid and you're in trouble and mom or dad's on the way to help you, that's great news. When you've done something wrong and mom and dad are on the way quickly, that's not so good news. <laughs> and that's what's happening here. He says, you guys have got to change this. It doesn't mean the church in Pergamon was engaged in overt idolatry just yet but they were tolerating the idea. So even while there was a core of them being faithful, they were tolerating this idea that, well, more than one way to skin the cat here. And he says, you guys need to repent from this, otherwise I'm going to come and I'm not going to make war with them, I'm going to do it with you as well. If you remember in Ephesus, he told them, you guys go back, repent, go back to your first love, or otherwise I will remove your lampstand. He goes, I will, in other words, I will cease, you will cease to be one of my churches. Here he says, I'm just going to make war with you. Either way, those consequences are severe. So ultimately, God himself was going to resolve all this. So all that warning is taking place, all that is, is there. And in verse 17, it's the conclusion, which is the same, follows the same formula, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It's a little warning, it's a little listen up to everyone. It says, to him who overcomes, 
To him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone. Now, what's, what's he talking about here? That's a great question. <laughs> uh, it's funny, as I, was, I was studying and reading this, you go, okay, I, sometimes you come across something, you go, okay, I need to do a little more research here on this. What could this possibly be? Now, obviously, manna is something we are familiar with, the idea of manna. That's the bread that God gave the people of Israel the four years they went in the wilderness. They woke up every morning and got this food off of the ground. So we know manna is the bread-like substance that God provided the people of Israel as they went through the wilderness. It's something that Christ will refer to in the Gospels. He says, I am the bread of life. It's, he's, he's alluding to the manna, the heavenly, the heavenly bread from heaven. So we, we're familiar with that idea. So there's this idea in manna of something that sustains you, something that, that uh, keeps you alive. Um, now, there is also, though, and this is not necessarily from Scripture, but we just know from, from Jewish literature, rabbinical literature from that day and age, that there was a Jewish tradition in this time. Again, this is not in Scripture, but this is just a Jewish tradition that said that there was a jar of manna from the wilderness. They had been picked up in the wilderness while they were in the, in the desert for those 40 years. It, they had collected that, put it in a jar, and that jar had been placed in the Ark of the Covenant, along with the Ten Commandments and all that type of stuff. Now, this isn't in the Bible, but this is, a, this is a, just a Jewish tradition. And, uh, you know, obviously we don't really know whatever happened to the, to the Ark of the Covenant. It just it disappeared at some point. And probably, you know, while I love, while I love the Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, that's probably not what really happened. Um, it'd be cool if it was in a storage building somewhere in Nevada, but it probably isn't. Um, <laughs> but... Um, the story is, in Jewish tradition, that before the temple was going to be ransacked, that the prophet Jeremiah took the Ark of the Covenant that contained this hidden jar of manna and hid it somewhere around Mount Sinai where it's supposed to stay till the end of the, the, end of the world. Now, if that's in what's in mind, and that's possible that you know, John has, that's what's in mind here, Either way, there is this idea that the hidden man is something that's going to show up at the end. Whether Jesus himself is the manna, or whether the manna is a symbol of God's sustaining life, or whether it refers to this hidden manna that's supposed to show up at the end of the world, whatever it might be, the, 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 to the victor, to the overcomer, the one who stays with the Lord through all this, they're going to see that. They're going to see what God has hidden and preserved for our lives. That's, that would be kind of the picture there. Now, the second one is this. He says, I will also give him a white stone and a new name written on that stone. So what's, what's this white stone? Uh, I'd be curious. Um, how many of us guys, how many of us guys collected rocks when we were kids? One, two, three, four. At least four of us did. I did. I collected rocks. Uh, my son Ben collected rocks for a while. Um, in fact, Collecting rocks is great because when you're a dad, you get to travel around the world from time to time, and you know your son collects rocks. You just pick up a rock from whatever country you're in, you bring it back. It's a really cheap souvenir. <laughs> and I've done that. I've actually got uh, a rock in my office from Israel. I've also got one from the Black Sea, the Turkish coast of the Black Sea. I took, pulled it out of the water there. So I've got a couple of rocks from different parts of the world there. Um, but this is a white stone. So we, we're, we're going to get a rock. <laughs> Yay. Now, on this rock is written a name. Now, again, what's the significance of a white stone? Well, we're, we're, we're speculating a little bit here because there's not really just a clear idea. I think the most likely ones are one of two things. Um, when they had trials back in that day and age, if there was a jury, if there was a decision being made, the way they would do that, if, for whatever jury trial there might be, the jurors were given a black stone and a white stone at the end of the trial, and the black stone represented guilty, and the white stone, white stone represented not guilty. And maybe this has something to do with the Lord pronouncing us not guilty at the end of time. That's possible. I think perhaps a more likely scenario, though, might be that it was not uncommon uh, in that day and age if you were going to attend some type of an event, whether it be a celebration or a festival, or you go to the amphitheater, you go to the, whatever it is you're going to. Obviously, they don't have Ticketmaster, 
uh, back then. So how do you get in? Well, sometimes they would distribute white rocks. And you, if you had the white rocks, that was kind of your ticket in, so to speak. And it's possible, I mean, I can see this as being something along these lines. I want to give you a, a rock with your name on it. This is your get into heaven free card, so to speak. Now, I'm having a little fun with that idea. But you get the point. It is, to him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. You will receive what you need for eternal life at the end, and you will get in, so to speak. Now, that is speculative. To a certain, I, I acknowledge that. But I think it kind of fits what's going on throughout the whole book of Revelation and what's going on here. Either way, to him who overcomes, they will receive the reward that God gives them versus the ones who God shows up and makes war on. See that contrast? One you're in, one, one you're out. So this is the church at Pergamon. Uh, any, any questions or comments? All right, and that's always just a reminder, by the way, anytime we meet together, uh, you guys, those of you in the room especially, can always raise a hand, ask a question, comment on things. Uh, if you are online watching us, uh, sometimes we don't always pay real close attention, but you're always free to, uh, to ask a question on the Facebook feed, and if we see that, we'll try to get to it, if at all possible. But uh, uh, there is a church at Pergamum. Next week, we will look at the church, uh, the message of the church in uh, the city of Thyatira. We have four more of these letters before we get to Revelation chapter 4 and uh, seeing some, uh, some more dynamic, incredible uh, things, th things we tend to think about when we think about the book of, of Revelation. So if you are with us tonight online, we're going to take the time here to pray. I encourage you to do that where you are at home, but we're going to go ahead and shut things down now. So thanks for joining us. I hope to see you on Sunday morning. Y'all have a good evening.